I'm a new postdoc at the CFA at Karen Ewerks Group, and today I will talk about post outburst chemistry in a very low luminosity object, or also like a velo. So, um, when I look at this very beautiful cartoon that illustrates the different stages of star formation, I, as an astrochemist, think about some of the questions like how does the chemistry change during the different stages of star formation? Or also, how do the physical conditions influence chemistry and vice versa? And also, how does the individual evolution of the protostar influence the chemistry? because molecule, molecules are found everywhere at all of those stages. And when it comes to investigating how the first initial building blocks of life form, a crucial piece that astrochemistry is investigating is to assess where they form, when they form, and also if they get inherited from one of the stages to the subsequent one, and also the level of reprocessing that um, gets inferred on them. And a lot of those informations we can get from uh, molecular lines when we look at them. So I will just briefly introduce that to you. So what you see here is like um, a molecule H and C that I found in a value that I'm going to talk about today. And from the intensity of molecules, we can, for instance, infer how much of a molecule is present, so its abundance. But we can also look at line ratios of different molecules. So for instance, HCN over H and C um, is an interstellar thermometer that is closely linked to the kinetic gas temperature. So from those two molecules, we can learn something about the temperature or also the density. On the other hand, HCN on its own, its hyperfine, um, com um, its hyperfine transitions tell us something about the opacity. And last but not least, the line profile of lines can show us something about the velocity information, so the movement of the gas. So for instance, in this value, the different isotopologues of CO trace different um, velocity components. Clearly, CO traces two different layers of gas, and also the different levels of broadening can tell us something about the information. But now I have told you a bit about how we can use molecular lines to study protocellular system properties, but I haven't told you yet what the, what the value is exactly. And um, per definition, a value is defined as a young stellar object that has an internal luminosity that is smaller than 0.1 solar luminosities. And it is still a bit of a debate what exactly those objects are. So they are either young class zero sources or extremely low mass protostars or even protobrown dwarfs. And another explanation for the nature of a velo is that they are actually the quiescent phase of the episodic accretion process. So in the first cartoon here, you have like your central protostar. It heats up material very close to its um, point where it is, and the rest of the envelope material is pretty cold. But when it outbursts, it increases in luminosity, and it starts to heat up more of its surrounding system. But this outburst is very short. So then the protostar goes back to its quiescent luminosity phase. And the material is first heated, and then it goes back to um, its cool state. And it is extremely rare to catch such an increase in luminosity because they are short-lived. But for us, what is lucky for chemistry is that the um, molecules lag behind. So like the imprint of the thermal history changes, and the value is much more prevalent on the chemistry. So we can start to study values if we want to learn something about um, the 
outburst chemistry. And the value that I'm going to talk about is in a cloud that has a name with some numbers. And um, it was first detected as part of the Spitzer Legacy project from molecular clouds to planet forming disks. And since then, it has also been investigated with ground-based telescopes. So there are high-resolution ARMA observations that have investigated CO isotopologues and N2H+. The value also has a prominent outflow that is revealed by ASTA observations and has been traced in CO. And what my work is that I have um, low-resolution APEX data, which is also a signal dish radio telescope that um, we are used to probe its molecular inventory. And the reason that we chose that specific value is because of the ARMA findings. Because N2H plus and CO are closely intertwined. And what N2H plus does, it reveals the position of the CO snow line. And um, N2H plus is a gas phase species, and CO is really, really good at, at destroying it. So if you have CO in the gas phase, it destroys your N2H plus. But once the temperature is cool enough that CO freezes onto the grains, you will suddenly have a lot of N2H plus in the gas phase. And this is what we call so called snow lines. So at 20 Kelvin, CO starts to freeze out. So at this point, it can't destroy the N2H plus in the gas phase anymore. So beyond the CO snow line, you would expect to see a lot of N2H plus. And in the inner parts within the CO snow line, you would not expect to see a lot of it. And what the ARMA observations on the value have revealed, and yeah, and during the outburst, the material um, is heated um, at larger distances to the protostar. So this CO snow line is actually shifted. So the NTH plus abundance moves to a different position. And the ARMA observations did exactly that. They looked at positions of CO and at N2H+. Plus. And basically what you see in orange here are the contours of the N2H+, plus, and the white blob is its peak N2H plus abundance. And what the authors of the paper did from the ARMA observations is they derived the abundance profiles of N2H plus and CO, and they came to the conclusion that the CO snow line currently is five times farther out than the luminosity of the protostar would allow for. So the conclusion of their paper was that the outburst has, has moved the CO snow line outwards, and this was the reason that they saw the N2H plus at this position. And we then went in and we were like, okay, can we find other chemical traces of the outburst? So um, with ARMA, you have, the, um, you have the resolution. So you can get multiple observations um, at multiple points in the disk. So if you want to derive a radial abundance profile, it's ideal. But on the other hand, the spectral windows are very narrow. So you can focus a few lines in large detail. But we wanted to find a lot of molecules. So, but this comes at the lack of spatial resolution. So we have a huge coverage with APEX, but we don't really know where the material is stemming from. But still, you can look what lines are there, and then you can go back to other high-resolution data um, to see um, if there are any matches. So for instance, there's this really nice work of Lucas de Honiach, where he investigated a lot of protostars and grouped the molecules that he found into different components of the system. And I was able to compare the molecules that I find in APEX data with like components that are, for instance, typical for the cavity walls. So in the apex data, there are species such as C2D or cyclopropanilidine that are commonly associated with the cavity walls that are due to the outbursts. So we find those. We also have very typical classic code envelope traces such as CO or N2D plus or DCO plus in the data. There's no chat because there's, for instance, a non-detection of SIO, but we also see um, traces of the outflow. We didn't find any warm in uh, envelope species but we found additional cold envelope materials such as formaldehyde, methanol, deuterated molecules, SO, and NO. And this came as a bit of surprise, and we think that the outburst is the reason that we actually detected those molecules. So the formaldehyde and methanol lines that I detect in the data, they have very low upper energies, so they shouldn't be in the gas phase. But um, the outburst has removed it fr them from the grains, and this is why we detected them. And the excitation temperature of those two molecules is also very cold. So it's in a range of 10 to 15 Kelvin. And their abundance ratio actually allows us to derive that they stem from the grains and not from the gas phase. But the largest surprise was the detection of NO. Because NO is a species that has been detected in a handful of sources so far, and we weren't even initially targeting it because it is, as I said, extremely rare and it is also extremely volatile and it forms in a gas phase from sublimation products of ammonia and water. And we think that NO traces the shifted water snow line from the outburst. Because what happened here is that the material got heated far enough that some species such as ammonia and water came off the grains. 
and water can photodissociate in OH and if you have atomic nitrogen that is available, it will form an O. So the freshly sublimated IC material actually fueled active gas phase chemistry that led to the formation and the detection of NO. So we don't know if the NO formation is still present or if it has already stopped, but at some point the shift at water snow line was far enough that we um, were able to detect the NO. And yeah, so it could be that it is a potential trace of the position of the water snow line. So the next step, of course, would be to go back to ALMA and ask for now a better spatial resolution to actually confirm it, because we know that it is there, but we can't ex exactly pinpoint its location in the data. And this already brings me to my summary. So um, I hope that I convinced you that studying values can be interesting from two points of use in the evolutionary stage because for one, they reveal changes in the temperature profile at the very early evolution of the protostellar evolution, but they also unveil composition of the icy reservoir that forms comets or outer planets <laughs> because of due to shifting in a snow line, for instance. So um, if the material gets shifted outwards, you suddenly have like water in the gas phase farther out than you would usually expect it. And if you already form your pebbles, that can accrete some of the water rich gas. And yeah, and at the end, I talked a bit about that NO could potentially be used to trace the shifted position of the water snow line during outburst events. But of course, this would be needed to be confirmed with additional observations and potentially also in more objects than this. And yeah, thank you for your attention and I'm happy to take any questions you might have. Okay, um, let me just go back. Yeah, so sometimes non-detections are a blessing. So we had a lot of formaldehyde and methanol lines covered in um, our data, but we only found those two. And what I basically did, I was playing around with models to reproduce the intensity of those two lines um, while simultaneously also non-detecting all the other lines. So if the temperature goes um, up to 20 Kelvin or even more, the other lines should have been above the noise level, so we should have clearly seen them in the data, but we don't. Any question about the, the sort of demographics of these clouds? So you, yeah. you picked out this particular low luminosity example, but you've also connected it to you know, the possibility that maybe about photo brown dwarfs. So is it indeed the case that you see many, many of these low luminosity ones compared to high luminosity ones? Um, so I'm not sure about um, the numbers compared to the higher ones. So I brought up the proto brown dwarfs because it's still, so the values are still accreting mass from its envelope. And for instance, in the case, that one has um, a current mass of 0 0.06 solar masses. And depending on like the range of accretion models that they run, it could either end up just above like the mass threshold that makes it like into a proto star, or it could also be just below. So because yeah, most of them are still accreting, it's not really sure what they're gonna end up with. But I think it's worth studying them to better understand the very um, low end of the interstellar mass function now. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so the title says that I'm going to talk about supermassive black holes in plural uh, in high redshift galaxies, but in fact I'm going to talk to you most of the time about one, one particular one, uh, which has been seen, which, which is a galaxy discovered by JWST and the supermassive black hole uh, has been seen by Chandra. So 
Why, why do we care? Why are we interested in supermassive black holes? And why do we want to know how did the first supermassive black holes form? Well, obviously, the answer is because we are not certain about that. There are multiple theories how they might have formed, and we want to know if it's one or the other, or actually it's maybe a mix, and uh, you can, there are multiple formation scenarios. So there are two main channels. Uh, I'm, of course, simplifying things a bit, but there are two main channels. One of them is the light seed scenario, uh, which implies that the first supermassive black holes at very high redshift, let's say at redshift 25, uh, formed from the collapse of population-free stars. If, even though these are massive stars, the black hole seeds that could form from the collapse of these population-free stars are uh, uh, not very, very massive. They, have a typical, they are expected to have 10 to 100 solar mass, to result 10 to 100 solar mass black holes. So they are, um, there used to be a stick here, and there's still a stick. So they are right here, down there, and in order to go from these low stellar masses, from 10 to 100 solar mass, all the way to the observed quasars here, or the AGN that I'm going to tell you, which is roughly here, you need continuous Eddington accretion, or actually super Eddington accretion to reach, so, which is not very easy. In fact, it's very difficult. Okay? Um, then there is the other scenario, the heavy seed scenario, which implies the direct collapse of massive gas clouds. The advantage of this method is that, or, or this, this theory, is that the black hole seeds that form in this channel have much, have much higher mass, 10 to the 4, 10 to the 5 solar masses. So in this case, if we start from here, super Eddington, uh, super Eddington accretion is not needed, so you can accrete, can accrete with Eddington or even with sub Eddington accretion uh, to reach these masses, or even masses here, the thing that I'm going to tell you about. Okay, so after this very quick introduction, let me just show you the whole story in one picture. Okay, um, so what I'm going to, to tell you about is, a, is an AGN, which is located in a high redshift galaxy called UHZ1, and it's magnified, it's gravitational lensed. So what is lensing in gravitational? It's, it's the Hubble Frontier Field Cluster, ABLE 2744, which is an excellent gravitational lens. Um, it was one of the early release science, or early release programs of JWST. Um, and JWST revealed a large number of galaxies, high redshift galaxies, for, in, in multiple It was studied in multiple prog programs, for example, in GLASS or in the Uncover prog program. So on the top, here you see the JWST NIRCAM images. This is ABLE 2744. You zoom out, and this little smudge here, as you can see, this is a galaxy. It's shown as redshift 10.3, but I'm going to show that it's in fact at redshift 10.1. Um, and this is a typical dropout galaxy. You see that in the blue S band, it disappears. If you zoom in or look at the paper, then you can see that this galaxy actually has really some structure, some interesting structure, so it might be even a merger. So this is a redshift 10.1 galaxies I will show you in a second. The stellar mass of the galaxy is 10, point, uh, 10 to the 8 solar masses. We also have Chandra follow-up data, uh, roughly 1.25 megasegment when this paper was written. And if you cannot you know, convert the, the seconds to days immediately, I can tell you that this is roughly two weeks worth of Chandra, of continuous Chandra observations. And the deposition, so we cross-created the list of high redshift galaxies, so redshift 9, 10, 11, 12 galaxies detected by JWST with the Chandra uh, data. And what we have found is that at the position of UHZ1, there is, so this is the contours, there is an X-ray point source. Um, I will show you more details in a second, but I'm going to, sum, I'm just a summary is here. If we analyze the X-ray data, what we find is the bolometric X-ray luminosity of the AGN is roughly this 5 times 10 to 45, Ergs per second, and if you assume that it uh, accretes at Eddington, then the corresponding black hole mass is, I'm saying here, 10 to 4 times 10 to the 7, so it's roughly 10 to 7, 10 to 8 solar masses. So if you look at this number, the stellar <coughs> mass of the galaxy 10 to the 8, you look at the black hole mass, which is roughly 10 to the 7, 10 to the 8, what you can find out is that the black hole to galaxy stellar mass ratio is an astonishing 0.3. So this is much, much higher, two, three orders of magnitude higher than what we see in the local universe, where the black hole to galaxy stellar mass ratio is typically 0.1, So this is very, very, very high. Now, I just show you the same picture again. So this is a dropout uh, galaxy. And you see here the same images. And what you see here uh, is the photometry of the galaxy. So the photometric redshift was roughly 10. Multiple independence methods found that the same redshift 
I'm not gonna waste any more time on this because since then uh, this UHZ, the, the Galaxy UHZ-1 was followed up spectroscopically, so we have now near-spec spectrum of UHZ-1, and now it's a spectroscopically confirmed galaxy at redshift 10.1, 10 10.07. Okay, so this has been published. Um, the lensing magnification at the location is 3.8, so it is very important uh, that this galaxy is highly magnified. Without this high lensing magnification, we wouldn't have seen the X-ray AGN in the Chandra data. The star formation rate is 1.3 solar masses, plus minus roughly 30% uncertainty, and the stellar mass, as I said, is roughly 10 to the 8 solar masses. <coughs> now let's go to the interesting part, okay? Because we have seen uh, high redshift galaxies, many high redshift galaxies with JWST, but X-ray AGN are few and far between, especially at redshift 10. So, when we looked at the Chandra data, we detected an X-ray source which is co-spatial with UHZ-1, with the galaxy. So, what we have seen is that the galaxy is detected in the hard X-ray bands. So, hard, hard X-ray band with Chandra is, is 2 to 7 kV band, and if you convert that to the rest frame of the galaxy, that's roughly 20 to 70 kV band. So, this is essentially like hard, so Chandra is operating as a hard X-ray telescope at these high redshifts. So this is about 2744, okay, so this is a merging cluster. It looks much more exciting than in, in the JWST images. I hope you agree with me. Um, and here is UHZ-1, and if you zoom in, you see, again, it's kind of, it's the same image, so you see this couple of pixels, and this couple of pixels include 42 X-ray counts. So when we talk about X-rays, we actually uh, can count every single photon. We sometimes give names to them, okay? <laughs> Not in this case, though. So, you have 42 counts. If you make a neighboring region, which we call background region here, um, and, you ex and, and you calculate how many counts you have here, you, and you uh, uh, compute how many background, background counts you expect in this region, you find that roughly half of the counts uh, should be a background count. So, you have, we have 42 counts here. Based on this nearby region, we expect, nearby analysts, we expect 21 counts. So we have roughly 21 counts, source counts, 21 excess counts, which can be associated with this uh, X-ray source. You com compute the significance of this, and you get that it's roughly 4.2 significance level. Now this is the point where you look at this image and you tell me that, oh, there are a couple of bright pixels, here's a bright pixel, here's a bright pixel. So are there any more X-ray sources which are similar to that? Now, to Further convince you that it's actually not the case, what we have done, we have taken a big region, so this region around the, uh, around the UHZ-1, so UHZ-1 is here, it's messed out. So the side length of this box is 25 arc seconds, which corresponds to roughly 50 pixels on the side. So all together you have 2,500 pixels, and we just smooth this, Im smooth this image a little bit. What we have done, we assume that every single pixel uh, uh, has a point source just like, or what is the likelihood that a single pixel, every single pixel, we have a point source just like we see here in the center, right? So we calculated the number of counts in a one arc second uh, radius source extraction re region, just like for UHZ-1, and calculated the number of counts within each of these regions. So obviously 50 pixels on the side, so 2,500 regions roughly, um, and this is what we get. So the distribution of the counts is on the or the number of counts is on the x-axis, and you will see here is that, that the peak is typically around 20 counts. Okay, so most of these regions have 20 counts uh, in them. This is our background region that I showed you, the annulus, and UHZ-1 is here. So none of these regions surrounding the galaxy uh, or UHZ-1 has 42 counts, but the mean is more like, nine, more like 20. So if you use this kind of statistics or this kind of approach, then you get detection significance of 4.4 sigma. Okay, so now we are brave X-ray astrophysicists here, so we can try to do X-ray spectroscopy with 40 counts. <laughs> At redshift 10, okay? You're laughing, but it's, that's what we do. It's published. So, um, if we try to do this, then this is the total spectrum, so gray is the total spectrum. Um, and the main, main idea with the spectroscopy is to find out the X-ray characteristic, characteristics of the source, right? So 
immediately, oh, I need two more minutes. So what you can see here immediately is that the, the, these are the best fit, or, or these are the UHZ1 uh, counts, essentially. So what you see here is not detected at low energy, so below 1.5 kV, and this implies that this is a highly obscured source. Again, if it's not detected below 1.5 kV, that means in the rest frame, it's not detected roughly below 15 kV. So the column density is roughly 10 to the 24, or a few times 10 to the 24, uh, uh, sorry, so 10 to the 24, which implies a bolometric X-ray luminosity, luminosity of 5 times 10 to 45 orcs per second. And again, this is the black hole mass, as I mentioned. Now, this is my, <coughs> I think the last slide, almost last slide. Um, so this is a growth curve. It is something similar that I showed on the very first slide. And essentially, this summarizes the big picture. So if the black hole is formed by the light seed scenario, starting with a seed mass of 10 to 100 solar mass is at redshift 25, and you start to grow with the Eddington accretion rate, then at redshift 10, you only get to like 10 to the 4 solar masses. So you are a few orders of magnitude, actually 2 to 4 orders of magnitude below the black hole mass of UHZ1. Okay? If, however, you start with a heavy seed, you can get there from redshift 25 to redshift 10 with Eddington accretion. Okay? And these shaded curves here mean the super Eddington accretion rate. And again, if you start with 10 to 100, you need a continuous ac accretion at two times the Eddington rate, which is, again, uh, theoretically very difficult. So given this growth curve and given the very high black hole mass uh, to black hole to galaxy mass ratio, all of these argues that in this particular case, the heavy seed models or, or this favors the heavy seed model. So UHZ1 will favor the heavy seed model. So here is a summary, and I just show you one plot uh, with the galaxy mass or barge mass here against the uh, black hole mass. These are all local galaxies, and this is just to illustrate how, how much of an outlier UHZ1 is okay, compared to local galaxies. So again, it's several orders of magnitude higher, this black hole mass to uh, galaxy mass, it's several orders of magnitude higher than it is in nearby galaxies. But it's based on the studies that we see for high redshift, galax uh, high redshift galaxies and their, and their black holes. This is, not a this is not a unique case, and we seem that this seems to be the case for many, many uh, black holes at high redshift. So UHZ1 is special in the sense that we see it in the X-rays, but this very high black hole, to, black hole to galaxy mass ratio is not special. So thank you very much. No, it's bolometric. So, so there were there were many steps which I have hidden here. Yeah, but do you really have the UV optical luminosity of that? No, only X-ray. So we we, we so use an X-ray to bolometric. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Ten minutes. I have to hide many details here. <laughs> But, but actually, if you want to read the paper, you can scan. <laughs> I'm prepared for everything. Um, uh, perhaps a naive question. I mean, your X-ray spectra that you had, uh, was that kind of made using all of the photons? That was with all, all photons, yes. But you kind of were saying that we expect 20 of them, roughly, to be from the background. Mm -hmm. Like, how does, how, how does that work? Does it just not OK, more, more, more details that I have hidden here. Uh, so what, what, what you do here is actually different things. So essentially, you measure a spectrum here, right? That is the spectrum of the galaxy and the ICM, so the intracluster medium. So most of these background counts are coming from this intracluster uh, gas from the galaxy cluster. So what you measure here is only the ICM. Right? So what you do when you try to fit the spectrum of this region is you, you, you can find the best fit spectrum of the ICM using this region. And when you fit, you use like two spectra. One of them is the a power, a simple power. Well, actually, it's not a power emission. It's a much more complicated model because it's an obscured AGN. Uh, and the ICM together. So that's what you do. So you establish the ICM here, and you just use that model to fit this. I'm wondering, I, I'm, I'm really struck by these growth curves, basically, and I'm wondering 
if so I'm thinking about the fact that you know technically if there's gas around the black hole is totally allowed to eat it above its Eddington limit the emergent luminosity will be less but I'm wondering if that says something about the population of sources say at redshift if you go to slightly higher redshift the scenario where it's growing slowly, would that create a different number of obscured sources than, say, the scenario where every black hole is growing at a sort of super Eddington rate? Like, do you think you can use the population of obscured, you know, at like high at, column density? At um, this redshift? I mean, the, the issue with this is that I wouldn't try to do a population study based on a single object. Right, but what about when, <laughs> say, you have 20 of what do you think you'll be able to do in this picture? Do you think that that will give you clarity or about the formation scenario? I, 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 I don't know. I really don't know. Okay. Uh, yeah, that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even dream about having 20 of these. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> yeah. Very simply, uh, could that be that because of the lensing, you're overestimating the mass of black or how you can that of the lens. No, the lensing, so the, the lensing is, everything is correct. So lensing is achromatic, so it, every photon is lensed by the same magnitude, and we did correct for that. So you're sure about this? Yes. Okay. Yep. So the, the lensing model, so the lensing model for ABA 2744 is, I think it's one of the best, if not the best, of all the Hubble Frontier field clusters. So many, many groups spent huge amount of time developing perfect models for this one, especially in this particular case. Um, how, given your expectation that it's heavily obscured, this sort of thing, do you, I guess that's not your part of this, but do you know how uncertain that makes the stellar mass estimate of the galaxy? The stellar mass estimate, no, sorry. So what is obscured is the AGN. So the galaxy itself has very little obs obscuration. The, Latest, so in this paper, in Andy Goulding's paper, uh, sorry, this one in, in, in Andy Goulding's paper, they did recompute the uh, stellar mass of the galaxy, and I didn't put the arrow bars here, it's not a very good style here, but the arrow bar is roughly 30, 30 to 40 percent on this. Okay. okay. In the original paper, when they only had the photometric data, no spectroscopic data, the uncertainty was larger, I don't, I don't quite remember, but the newest one is like 30 to 40% uncertainty. So that's just the, the obscuration is heavily concentrated? Heavily concentrated, yes. So what, one interesting thing is that actually, uh, interesting and not surprising, that the AGN, we don't see the AGN lines in the JW spectrum, but this is near spec, and it's not totally surprising because the typical uh, AGN emission lines, so oxygen free and H beta, H beta they don't fall into the wavelength range for near spec. So you, we would need MIRI data to, do, to actually see those AGN emission lines. Hmm? All right. Thank you. Thank you. I'll give you the mic. Starts up again. All right, excellent. Yeah. All right. Uh, hi everyone. Um, excited to here to talk about a paper that I recently got on the archive. It's a 30-page paper, and I have a 10-minute talk, so there's definitely hidden details. So come talk to me after if you have a question. So what I'm going to talk about today are tidal disruption events. So a tidal disruption event occurs when a star gets too close to a supermassive black hole and is torn apart by the tidal forces surrounding that supermassive black hole. There's a lot of interesting implications for why we care about TDEs. Um, basically, you can use a supermassive black hole in its environment as a laboratory, see how suddenly an accretion of material changes the environment. You have the potential for relativistic jets that are launched when a TDE happens. In about 1% of TDEs, we see these relativistic jets. Uh, you have these outflows that you can study, as you can see in this picture, which I'm going to talk about a lot more in this talk. And there's also even potential multi-messenger physics. Some people think there might be neutrino associations associated with these TDEs. 
Uh, to date, about 100 TDEs have been reported. Most of them are discovered by optical surveys looking for supernovae, things like that, and then we follow up in the radio. And uh, the radio follow-up is important because we can trace these outflows of materials as they're going out, uh, interacting with their surrounding environments. Um, I should also mention at this point of the talk, traditionally radio TDE observations have been focused as soon as the TDE has been classified. You look in the first couple months uh, after the optical detection, and then at about 20-30% of cases you will detect radio emission. Otherwise, traditionally radio telescope time is precious. You go off and do other things with your time. But then the question is, of uh, what about late time emission if you go to go later? And recently there are three TDEs, uh, AT2018HYZ, which I published last year, Assassin 1509, and IPTF 16 FNL were three TDEs that became radio bright after 100 days, so over three months after the initial uh, TDE event happened. So then you start wondering, okay, if you have a few oddballs, that's one thing, but is this common? Are we missing something in the broader TDE population? So to find out, we did a campaign with the VLA and with Meerkat in radio of about two dozen older TDEs, so defined as at least two to three years old, some are a little older, that had no prior radio emission detected from those sources. So first, I'm just going to lay the landscape as it was uh, before this paper came out. So this is a luminosity plot, so we're adjusting for distance when we're talking about how bright these things are. Time since discovery here on the x-axis. This is a relativistic TDE, a very famous one. You can see much more luminous than this 99% of the non-relativistic TDE population. Uh, this yellow one here is just a typical TDE that was detected within the first few months. You can see it kind of rose and then it faded. Um, you have Assassin 150i and IPTF 16FNL. If you see a triangle on these plots, that's an upper limit, so you have no radio detection to that limit. And then this is AT2018HYZ, which I'm going to brag about because we're the ones who found it. And it's basically been shooting to the, you know, very high in luminosity uh, since it was detected 980 days roughly after the initial TDE event happened, as fast as T to the fifth at fifth, five gigahertz. Among friends, I'll tell you, it's still getting brighter, but not quite as bright, but it is still like, if you speak radio, it's 17 millijanskis right now, we detected it at one millijansky. So it's still getting very bright very quickly. But you know, we have the rest of them. So this is the same plot. I've just zoomed into a uh, smaller region to focus on different luminosities uh, than the full TD landscape. But I'm now going to add in the rest of the sources from our study. And what you see is uh, 10 new TDEs that did not have radio emission at early times that have now turned on uh, hundreds of days after the initial event. So it's 700 to 2,000 days roughly. You start seeing these turn-ons where you don't see any before. So this is a little complicated, so I'm going to highlight a few of these uh, TDEs in particular for you. So as I said, um, here there's several where we don't have great limits because nobody was quite expecting this emission to happen. So we're going to the VLA sky survey, things like that. But you can see that they got bright. We caught them fading. This one is really amazing to me. This is assess uh, 14 AE, so it's the oldest in our sample. Radio turn on was over 2,000 days after, and it's been rising as fast as T to the fourth ever since. So that's six years roughly after the TDE event happened. You have some good limits, and then suddenly it starts getting very bright fairly rapidly. This one I really like, AT2018ZR, because these are our two dedicated observations from our campaigns. We looked the third time, and oh, it's now radio bright. So, you know, it's called job security. You have to start checking on this population <laughs> that we haven't been uh, checking on before. But then there's also some other really cool details. So this yellow one here, I told you is a typical TDE that had initial brightening at early times, AT 2019 DSG. It was fading, and now it has a second brightening uh, at later times. So it's not enough that, okay, some of these are turning on earlier, some are turning on later. Some of them are doing it twice. So that's also very unanticipated, and we still have to figure out what exactly is happening there. The cool thing also, though, is so the 10 TDEs, uh, that's incidentally the first radio sample of radio TDEs we've ever had. It's roughly about half of the radio detected TDEs to date. So then you can start making cool histograms, right, to start thinking about what our population looks like. So this is first radio detection uh, with a number of TDEs. So the outlines are the first one that this is just everything in the literature, not just our survey. There were about 24 radio detected TDEs. So you can see that, you know, there is definitely a clump that you see in the middle here at about 100 days, so where people traditionally look. These are the relativistic TDs. They turn on very quickly, but there's just not that many of them. 
but the bulk of the population is really turning on at hundreds, thousands of days is the first radio detection. You could argue though, okay, you're a bit biased here. As I said, the sampling is not great on a lot of these TDEs for when they might've turned on. We can also consider though the peak of the radio emission. As you saw, there's a lot of different light curves, a lot of variety. But, so when is the brightest point that we can see in that light curve? We still have the same result though. The majority of these TDEs turn on at about a thousand days roughly instead of you know 100 days, which I think most people a month ago probably would have bet. We don't know this full distribution though, because as you can see, a lot of these are still getting brighter. So uh, this is going to be really exciting going forward to see how this population is uh, going to work in that sense as well. But it's not enough that we detected all these things. We also got multi-frequency data, which is very exciting in radio because if you have multi-frequency radio data for a single observation, you can extract physical parameters from your system via an equipartition function. So things like the radius of the outflow, the energy, the magnetic field, even the density of the material you're plowing into, these are all things that you can study uh, if you have a multi-frequency SED, uh, which we did. Obvi um, we don't have several SEDs yet for all of our objects. Some of them are just one, but we have a few that we have several observations. So we can start saying some interesting things and looking at the physical parameters of the outflows. One of the most naive things we were just trying to do is, okay, time and days radius, let's try to see if we can estimate the outflow launch velocity. It definitely worked better on some of these than others. <laughs> let's put it that way. I anticipate as we get keep studying these outflows over time, we're going to get better estimates on the launch dates. And then some of them we had to just sort of make an estimate. Well, okay, based off the light curve, we estimate this rough launch date. But it does look consistently that these radio emitting outflows have delay timescales about 500 to 2,000 days. And as I said, you have very good limits where you don't see anything at earlier times. So it doesn't look like we're missing something. These are genuinely some sort of radio outflow at later times. We can then start considering other op uh, parameter spaces as well. So on the x-axis here, I have velocity. On the y-axis here, I have energy. And this is the dividing line roughly between a relativistic and non-relativistic outflow. So you can see, so there's, this is the relativistic TDE I was talking about earlier, Swift J1644 plus 57. Over time, it became non-relativistic, so the curve goes that way. But then we have the bulk of this population here. AT2018HYZ is an unusual case, but the rest of them really appear to be, this is a consistent with a uh, supernova type energy velocity. So type 1BC supernovae. We basically, if you were to plot them, they would overlay with this population. Um, the arrows here, because some of these SEDs we unfortunately couldn't constrain, check the paper for all the gory details. But the real story here is, as I said, this is what we would consider a non-relativistic population of TDEs. So it's not that you suddenly have a bunch of jets that you're not you know, anticipating something like that. Something different is happening in this population. The other one that I really like is we can actually look at the radius and the density space for the TDEs, or rather surrounding these supermassive black holes. So here on the x-axis, we have the radius adjusting for the Schwarzschild radius of the individual black hole, because otherwise this plot wouldn't really work. And then the density in atoms per centimeter cubed. For reference, this line here is Sag A star, and this here is M87 star. And what you can see is most of these are fairly consistent with a Sag A star type of environment. So it isn't that you have, for example, you could imagine if you had a low density cavity and suddenly you hit a wall of very dense material, that's not, and then the radio would turn on. That's not what we're seeing here. These appear to be, you know, uh, fairly normal environments around supermassive black holes as best we can sample. I also, by the way, just really like this plot because filling this in, we're starting to get so much information about the density environments surrounding these supermassive black holes. Even better than, of course, for our own Sag, Sag A star because there's a lot of stuff between us and there. So it's a very exciting time. I'm almost done. <laughs> So the final question is, what is going on? <laughs> I mean, you have shown you a lot of data. There's a lot of interesting things happening. So here's what we know so far for this picture. It appears that up to 50% of the sample, 40, 50%, depending how you parse it, turns on in the radio roughly two to six years after the disruption of the star as seen in optical versus, as I said, 20, 30% at early times. You can argue with me that, okay, 20% versus 40%, that's not that big a deal. I'm still just going to point out that this is still, you know, I think most people would have told you zero to 10% uh, a month ago. So this is a very <laughs> different environment than that. And for also, there's this population of TDEs that have prompt radio emission, so AT2018 DSG, 
where we see a second rise in radio. And I really haven't heard of many people expecting something like that to happen. This is a population of primarily non-relativistic TDE outflows. So as I said, similar to a supernova, not a gamma ray burst or something like that. And they begin on years post TDE timescales. We can rule out off-axis jets for this population is what we said in this paper. Uh, there's basically a lot of things if you just look at the luminosity, the velocities we're seeing. There's definitely still some people who argue that first one, AT2018 HYZ, might be an off-axis jet. But the rest of the population is very inconsistent. Also, though, if those were all off-axis jets that we're suddenly seeing, you would see a lot more of these in the optical surveys to begin with, and the rates just don't match. Um, there's no clear markers, I know somebody's going to ask, with other wavelengths for which are going to turn on and at what time or anything like that. Uh, there's optical and x-ray data. It's going to be in a companion paper that's currently being written up by another collaborator, Kate Alexander. And some of them have some interesting correlations, this and that. But as I said, there's no smoking gun where it's going to be an easy problem to figure out. So yeah, the interpretation is as yet unclear for why these outflows happen. A uh, delayed disk formation was something, for example, we suggested in our paper. You could imagine if the accretion disk, when you see the initial optical flare, what you're seeing is a something like stream-stream collision. And what we're seeing later at times is an accretion disk being formed. I'm not exactly married to this idea. I'm not going to bet the farm. I'm actually, if anything, going to suppose that there might be multiple explanations for what causes these outflows. Um, but you know, this is ITC. I would really love to hear anybody's thoughts on this, either now or later times. So thank you very much. I mean, this is, this is all wonderful. So the radio is coming delayed by about a year. Over a year. Yeah, over a year. You might have said this, but I wasn't clear. Are you saying that the ejection itself is delayed by a year, or it's taking a year for early ejected material to find something to interact with? We think that the ejection itself is delayed by years, not that it takes time to turn on. That is from that radius versus time? Yes. Or? Okay. Uh -huh. the error bars are not enough to connect it to the... No, the error bars are not that big, surprisingly, on a lot of these. I mean, the data is obviously not as good as I would like, but every indication we have is not that these are prompt and then just turn on uh, later for the outflows. But also, how would you explain, like, the second uh, rises as well? That's another question, so... Um, you specifically brought it up, so no one asked, but I'm going to ask. So... <laughs> Yeah, so I mean, ZTF still looks, right? So we did go and check, and uh, Sebastian Gomez is actually the one who's done that legwork. And uh, there's nothing like, oh, if you had a second TD, that would explain all, or you know, you could imagine maybe there was a binary or all these things. That doesn't really, it's inconsistent with the data. So, yeah. Last question. I'm curious about the total sort of energy budget. So mm -hmm. I think as you, so a solar mass times c squared, as you know, is 10 to the 53 ergs. Mm -hmm. And if we're at 10 to the 49, that's starting to be basically an interesting fraction of like the mm -hmm. energy budget of a star um, is clearly going into this outflow. And so I think it'll be interesting to watch where these go. Like, how long does it last? That mm -hmm. might tell you about like the amount of mass that's flowing out as opposed to going in. And, as you were saying, like if it's correlated with the early optical properties versus not, maybe uh -huh. you learned something about, yeah. about both the inflow and outflow. So we did look into the correlation of yeah. mass of the black hole size and mass of the star size. Mass of the black hole is just noise. There's definitely nothing there. Uh, mass of the stars may be something, but the problem is, so you're running these models called a MOSFET based off the early optical light curve data. Yes. And there's a lot of error and uncertainty there on exactly. what exactly you're doing. So. I wouldn't, you know, bet the farm on that one just no, yet. I agree. Um, um, but it's really exciting. So yes, thanks. I agree. <laughs>
Um, can you can you hear me? Awesome. Yeah, I'll um, also attempt an impossible and uh, try to give a 10 minute talk on something that involves both uh, turbulence and numerics. Uh, but I also will try to, I'll do my best not to sound uh, uh, technical because this idea is uh, actually really simple and generic. So this is one of the rare examples where something so unphysical and artificial like uh, uh, numerical errors can conspire and give us physical result because of generic properties of turbulent flows. And so this is discussion, it will, uh, it's applicable to any turbulent flow, but I myself work on galaxy simulations, so I'll use galaxies to uh, set up the stage. Uh, okay, so with JWST, we now have uh, this uh, uh, picture, so observed galaxies, which now look as impressive as simulated ones, or in some cases, maybe even more impressive, uh, where we see the, the structures on ranges of scales, right? So we see the spiral arms, uh, bubbles, filaments. So the stars and galaxies, they form in this highly complex environment. And in fact, if we uh, zoom in onto the scales of individual star forming regions where stars form, we see that the structures continue down to the smallest scales. So the stars, they form in this complex environment and the, uh, which involves this vast ranges of scales. And this is what makes uh, modeling this process and galaxy simulations uh, very hard. So if we zoom in in our galaxy simulations to the scales, we'll never see beautiful pictures like this. Instead, we have to deal with something like this. <laughs> so none of this complex structure is resolved and we therefore need to uh, track process like star formation and feedback using uh, subgrid prescriptions. And often these prescriptions are very simplistic. So uh, if we had the information about turbulence on resolve scales, we could improve uh, on uh, uh, these methods. And in fact, uh, it's not only star formation feedback, it's any processes that uh, depend on the turbulence structure of gas on resolve scales that can be uh, improved. So what we need is uh, some prescription to model turbulence on unresolved scales. To understand the gen general approach to this, we can think of turbulence as uh, uh, the, uh, in terms of the power spectrum. So it's how much energy is, uh, kinetic energy is contained in different scales. And this energy is injected on some large scale, and then it propagates down to small and smaller scales until uh, viscosity becomes important and uh, kinetic energy is dissipated on this physical dissipation scales. But in galaxy simulations, the scales are many, many orders of magnitude smaller than what we can uh, realistically resolve. So what happens in reality in simulations is uh, this kinetic energy is dissipated at the resolution scale. So if we think of uh, this in terms of energy reservoirs, then this kinetic resolved kinetic energy, it, uh, converted, it's converted directly into thermal energy at the resolution scale by artificial, uh, by, by numerical viscosity. Um, so the idea of uh, a subgrid turbulence model is to um, gain some information about this missing part of the turbulence. Uh, so by, and this can be done by including this extra bucket of, tr of uh, energy in between uh, the resolved and uh, thermal energies, which will represent uh, subgrid energy. And then we can follow it with its own equation. And what's important is to uh, add the uh, uh, terms, explicit terms in our equations that will describe uh, the coupling between the resolved scales and uh, unresolved ones. So this general, this is the general idea behind the so-called uh, large eddy simulations, which are wildly used in uh, uh, um, uh, simulations of terrestrial turbulent flows and there are different applications from aerospace engineering all the way to uh, geophysics and climate models. And uh, I have been using this type of models in uh, galaxy simulations. So this is one of the examples of such simulations uh, where this is a simulation of a dwarf and to see 300 uh, galaxy where we also can model uh, subgrid uh, turbulence. So, and I must stress this is not something which is usually done in, in uh, galaxy formation simulations. Usually they do not include any explicit model for unresolved turbulence. But what it allows us to do is we can predict what the turbulent energy is in each uh, cell, right? So just like we predict what the uh, density, temperature, or in some cases radiation field is in, 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 in each cell, we can also tell what's the turbulent state of gas in each cell on unresolved scales. And based on this, we can do things like uh, modeling the star formation efficiency of uh, the turbulent medium. So usually in simulations, local star formation rate is parameterized through this so-called efficiency uh, of star formation, which uh, is uh, almost always as, uh, used as a, a tunable fixed parameter. But instead, uh, because we have uh, information about the uh, turbulent state of gas, we can forward model it 
uh, using um, uh, theoretical models that connect uh, star formation efficiency with the, uh, with the state of gas, like uh, Mach number or real parameter. And this is really important for modeling things like uh, forgetting, for, for getting uh, ISM structure realistically. Uh, I'll not go into details, but for example, um, things like decorrelations between CO and H alpha, which is now observed in uh, galaxies on small scales, uh, that will be really sensitive to what we assume about star formation efficiency and the models uh, where the star formation, uh, star formation efficiency is, mo is forward modeled, they can produce realistic uh, the structure. So this, this movie, by the way, shows the, how, uh, uh, how efficiency changes both in space and time in this case. And so this is one example. Another example where it can be important is early universe where GWST now sees this uh, abundance of bright galaxies. And one of the viable explanation is the exactly the variation of star formation efficiency at early time. So a model like this can be used to explore that. Um, so, but to do this, we need this model for unresolved turbulence, right? So, and uh, in, in this, kind, this type of explicit models, all the uncertainty and art of doing the simulations comes down to the, uh, understanding how to model this uh, coupling terms between subgrid and unresolved scales. At the same time, we know that uh, to model turbulent flows, it's not always necessary to have any explicit model. So uh, as long as the turbulent onset of the turbulent cascade is uh, resolved, uh, codes will follow uh, the cascade at the resolved scales correctly. So this, for example, here uh, shows uh, power spectra of turbulence in a, in a large number of simulations that run with the different codes of the same turbulent uh, initial conditions. And they all differ only at around resolution scale because they all, these different codes, they have different implementations, different uh, high dynamical methods, so they uh, have different associated uh, numerical uh, viscosity. But uh, at uh, large scales where the flow is resolved, they, all these codes, they, uh, uh, they ensure that the cascade of kinetic energy is correct. And this is generic property of any turbulent flow. So the cascade uh, rate and the dissipation rate in the turbulent flow will not depend on the viscosity. So viscosity says the scale on which this patient happens, right? So if we in, uh, decrease the viscosity, then the cascade, turbulent cascade will extend down to smaller scales until viscosity become, becomes important. So uh, viscosity, doesn't, viscosity does, does set the scale at which dissipation happens, but the rate of dissipation is set by how much energy cascades from larger scales. And this means that uh, uh, even though numerical viscosity dissipates energy on the wrong scale, at the resolution scale, the rate of dissipation is actually physical, and it's set by the energy cascade from large scales, right? So this means that we can use numerical dissipation as an approximate model for, uh, uh, for the cascade from the result scales to a uh, subgrid, and which, which, which means that we can just calculate how much energy locally is dissipated and then just put it into this explicitly modeled uh, unresolved turbulence. And this is the whole idea, and this model is very simple because it doesn't require much implementation, essentially because most of the model is already built in into the code itself. And this is, for example, how it uh, performs compared to uh, direct simulation. So this is a simulation of decaying supersonic turbulence, uh, where we can resolve turbulent cascade down to small scales, then coarse grain it and compute how much turbulent energy is in small scales. Then we can run low resolution simulation and try to predict what the uh, distribution must be. So and this is the, what this model gives. So in detail, the, the direct comparison is a bit different. It is a bit difficult because here this flow is more viscous, but what, uh, and because of the um, um, low resolution. But uh, what's important is that this model, it captures correctly uh, the correlations between local uh, turbulence and the properties of the resolved flow. And this is really important for things like modeling local star formation efficiency or like real parameter of turbulence Mach number. Um, and I can show more plots to show this quantitatively, but instead what I want to end up with is uh, more like realistic applications in the context of galaxy simulations. A, mod a simple model like this, it uh, produces results which are very similar to this more complex models with explicit, with with explicit, with explicit subgrid turbulence that I showed before in this uh, movie in terms of things like uh, the distribution of uh, small-scale turbulence or uh, local star formation efficiencies as a function of kiloparsec scale environment like a gas density. So all these models, they predict comparable result and also they are comparable to what is uh, observed in real galaxies. And again, I'll 
again, to stress in this simple model, this all comes from this, uh, from capturing this unphysical, uh, uh, unphysical numerical errors, which conspire to give us this correct result because of this generic property of the turbulent flow. And yeah, and here I'll just leave my summary and we'll take any questions. This one? Ah, so the, yeah, so these are just different, uh, these are simulations with different resolution. So this one on top is high resolution simulation where, which we can coarse grain to compute local uh, uh, velocity for local, local so kinetic. Yeah, this is just the resolution. So this one, so this one is 1024 cube and this one is 64 cube. So naturally because, because of the, because of the numerical errors, uh, numerical viscosity, you get the smooth flow at resolution scale. Right. But what's important is that the correlations are preserved, correlations between the uh, unresolved turbulence and uh, the result flow. Yeah. Yeah. I'm curious how we convince ourselves in a galaxy that has like a bunch of different scales that we're resolving the driving scale, or the stirring scale. Yeah, that's a, that's a great point. And this is like the main, the main uncertainty in all these types of models. So in, in order for this to work, so this, this model... So here you know the stirring scale. Yeah, yeah, exactly, that's exactly. Great. <laughs> so the, the requirement that you need, yeah, you need to know that the uh, driving, the onset of cascade is at least marginally resolved. Mm -hmm. and, and typically it, it means uh, resolving something like the scale height of the disk. Yes, okay. So, yeah. Okay. So this, this might be possible in, for example, zoom in simulations of galaxies yeah, where, yeah. where you can achieve this kind of resolutions. Probably not in some like cosmological. And then does that affect the thermodynamics basically if that's like at an unresolved scale rather than an average density and thermal energy, your gas instead has, say, more kinetic energy and less thermal energy. And yeah, in principle, in, in, in does that affect, it, for example, the cooling? It's exactly, exactly. It does because in what what it, what this uh, model does, it preserves this part of the non-thermal mm -hmm. component, right, which has different cooling properties, right? So it decays in local crossing times, right, instead of. Uh, whatever radiative processes are yeah. included, right? So, and, and it also provides the non-thermal pressure, right? right? So essentially, you can you can you can maintain this pressure for longer in, in your simulation. Yeah. Without so without this model, all this kinetic energy will be converted into thermal energy, right? Which will be subjected to uh, radiative cooling. Yes, I see. I see. So it's when you couple to radiative cooling that has specific kind of scale. Exactly, yeah. So in the, uh, without, without cooling, it's, uh, 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 this type of, uh, this turbulence will behave in the same way as uh, thermal energy because it's, it's, it's even like the same equation of state because, so this ages, they can be thought, it's like isotropic and turbulence that can be thought of as, uh, uh, as thermal energy with the same, yeah. It, it behaves exactly the same way. Thank you.